well, uh, welcome uh, uh, Eva and welcome to all of you to this uh, uh, prize award ceremony for the third Jean Kunzmann Prize. As you can see, there is a, a big uh, uh, typo on my title. I'm very sorry for that. There is also a typo on uh, the logo of our sponsors. But it gives me the opportunity to tell you that uh, this prize has been organized by uh, the Paul Emstick of uh, the Commu uh, of uh, Université Grenoble Alpes. Uh, it is also organized by uh, INRIA and its local center in Montbonneau, and finally by uh, Percival Lab. So, uh, by the way, maybe a few people don't know me. I'm, my name is Eric Bontier, and I was asked to introduce this uh, ceremony. Um, and uh, to tell you a few words about what this prize is about, or rather, who this prize is about. And uh, uh, Jean Kunzmann, after whom the prize is named, was a professor at the Université de Grenoble, and he was a pioneer in uh, computational sciences in the 50s. Um, he had uh, a broad range of interests, uh, going from uh, fundamental mathematics to robotics to linguistics, and he also was uh, very interested in uh, industrial problems and problems uh, that would affect society. At a time where it wasn't so easy, because a lot of uh, uh, professors by then uh, would rather enjoy the comfortable confinement of academia. But he had a vision, and just to give you a few elements of measure of his legacy, uh, today the community he helped form numbers about 1,200 people who work in eight laboratories that have all international recognition, uh, who work also at the local INRIA center, or at the, in teams of uh, Sarah Lady. Uh, he also had quite an impact on the educational landscape uh, of Grenoble. He helped create uh, NCMAG, uh, which is our flagship uh, uh, school of engineering, and uh, whose main focus is on mathematics and computer science. Uh, today, it is the LabEx uh, Percival Lab that is a, uh, uh, that perpetrates uh, Jean Kunzmann's uh, legacy. And uh, I should say a few words about the LabEx, uh, just to explain that to what, what kind of structure it is to our guests. Uh, it is an initiative of excellence, uh, sponsored and funded by the uh, French uh, ANR, which stands for Agence Nationale de la Recherche. And uh, it regroups about everybody that counts, and even those that, who don't count, uh, of the uh, computational science landscape. Uh, and when I say computational science, I mean it in a very large, very broad sense. So it goes from fundamental mathematics to uh, signal processing, robotics, computer science of all kinds, and it's quite, uh, it's quite uh, uh, a broad uh, spectrum. The LabEx is quite a stimulus for interdisciplinary research and organizes a number of activities uh, which range from traditional seminars to uh, robotics challenges, for instance, and also provides uh, uh, support for students and funding for projects. And there are about 10 institutional partners and laboratories that uh, actually belong to this LabEx. So going back to the Jean Kunzmann Prize, uh, as you can read there, it uh, distinguishes scientists who made exceptional contributions uh, in computational sciences or and uh, their applications. And uh, uh, in particular, uh, we try to follow the spirit of Jean Kunzmann and also uh, uh, see about the involvement of the recipients in uh, the applications, in the impact of their work on the rest of society. There were two editions previously. Uh, the first winner was Emmanuel Candes in 2014, and uh, Joachim Weikert got the prize in 2016. So what did we have in mind when we uh, 
when we created this prize, uh, well, first of all, we wanted to establish a series of uh, distinguished lectures, uh, which is uh, common things on, in many American universities, uh, in which uh, an expert would be invited to give a comprehensive overview of uh, his topic of uh, specialty. Uh, it was also a token to uh, encourage or to lure uh, the famous and busy people to come to Grenoble. Um, we also wanted to create a buzz that is taking, take advantage of uh, these visits to create some activity around these visits and activities that would be shared by people from several departments. And primarily, I think, and that's uh, the reason that uh, I have most at heart, uh, we think of, we used to like to think of that as an opportunity for our students to meet inspiring uh, people who do research at the highest level. So Eva Tardos is from Cornell University, is our next winner. And um, we uh, did prepare her visit uh, by running a, a reading course uh, on uh, some of her work. And that started in uh, early November and ran through all the months of February. Eva also uh, gave us uh, uh, two lectures and one to come tomorrow, uh, more specialized on the topic she chose. And her topic of choice was algorithmic game theory. And uh, I can assure you that during all those sessions, we did hear a lot about Nash equilibria, which is a central concept in uh, Eva's work. However, I must say that we already had heard of the work of John Nash, or at least some of the work of John Nash's. And uh, that's in a geometric context. And uh, the, the, uh, John Nash actually got interested in the question of how can you uh, map the flat square into the three-dimensional space. So let's see if this works. So to give you a quick idea of uh, what this is about, this is a flat square, but it's a periodic flat square, which means that uh, we have identified the points on opposite sides. That is, the point here is actually being taken as identical to that one. And one way of materializing this uh, identification would be to try to fold the flat square so that, and to glue together the opposite sides. And if you do that uh, by folding first uh, the green uh, sides of the square together, you get the cylinder, and then you would want to glue those things, so, so this end of the cylinder to the other end, and eventually you make a shape that looks like a donut. However, if you do that, uh, you have not preserved the distances between points. And for instance, uh, points in the inner rings here would be compressed, while the points on the outer rings would have been stretched. But there is a theorem of Nash and Kuiper from uh, 1955 that tells us that uh, there is a way to actually transform the flat square into a 3D shape without changing distances. And, uh, but it's a very abstract result. Uh, it took another 20 years uh, and the work of Gromov on convex integration to actually propose a, a method that could potentially be constructive into finding out what the shape of this object should be. So here are Nash, Kuiper, and Gromov, and uh, we are sure that they dreamed about these uh, shapes. But we made it in Grenoble. We, or at least colleagues of us, made it. And uh, this is what it looks like. Here's the flat torus. What you see is a donut with corrugations, and those corrugations are important because this is a gimmick that uh, helps preserve distances. And uh, the point I want to make here is that this is the result of a collaborative work between pure mathematicians 
applied mathematicians and computer scientists. And this work took place mostly here, a little bit in Lyon also, although we, not very, we don't like to say that much. <laughs> and, uh, and so here's the connection, John Nash, between uh, Eva's work and what we've been doing here. But you understand that this connection is somewhat uh, far apart, and some of us had a strange notion of what a Nash equilibrium really is. Anyway, this is tonight's program. Uh, we're very happy that uh, Mr. Piol was uh, able to join us, and I will uh, give him the floor in a second. Uh, Nadia Brauner will uh, then give us a short bio of uh, Eva Tardos's career, and then uh, Eva will receive the prize and give us a lecture uh, on learning by, uh, or learning in games, I'm sorry. God knows I know this title. And uh, then there will be a cocktail in the gallery of the museum, and of course you're all invited to join. So just to finish this uh, presentation, uh, let me give all our thanks to a number of people, uh, foremost to Eva and uh, David Schmoyz, who, by the way, gave us a very nice uh, talk on Tuesday on a bike sharing system in New York City uh, that could be of interest to uh, the Grenoble Township also. Um, many thanks also to uh, Mr. Piol and his team, uh, because uh, thanks to them, we can enjoy these wonderful facilities we like the museum, uh, we're happy to come out of our uh, academic uh, citadel, and, uh, and it's, it, it, it is a place that adds a lot of prestige to this place. Uh, my thanks also to uh, Marie-Christine as head of uh, Percival Lab, to Patrick Gros, uh, who, uh, directs the, uh, who heads the uh, INRIA Center in Montbonneau, to our colleagues at uh, our head of the poll uh, and stick, who actually found ways to sponsor this prize and uh, to keep it going. Many thanks also to Anne-Laure uh, Bernardin, who did all the, uh, all, all the work. Uh, she's the one that planned the meetings, that followed the meetings, that uh, uh, kept the web page updated, that uh, printed the badges, that uh, discussed with uh, and negotiated with a lot of people, and uh, 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 we are deeply grateful to, to her. Thanks to Boris and to uh, Francis, uh, who generously landed us the uh, flat tours for the good cause. Thanks also to the prospection committee. There is a committee that uh, thinks hard on who uh, the winner of the prize should be, and we had very interesting discussions and quite open discussions about uh, who should be nominated and for what reasons. And finally, uh, I'm also very grateful, we are very grateful to the lecturers of the reading courses, Nicolas, uh, Bruno, Andras, uh, who were quite enthusiastic and really help uh, uh, form a strong momentum for this prize. So with that, Mr. Pio uh, would be happy to leave you the floor. Thank you. Good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Um, special thanks to Marie-Christine Rousset, um, head of uh, Percival Lab. Uh, as well to Patrick Gros, uh, head of uh, INRIA Grenoble Center. Um, Miss uh, Eva Tardos, um, it's a pleasure to welcome you here for, for this prize, uh, to welcome uh, as well some known heads uh, in the room. Uh, a few words. First, uh, I would like to present my uh, excuse for the delay. I was actually discussing uh, with one of, one of my deputies about uh, can we be fresh and open-minded for a second term or not. Uh, and so for a 30 minutes uh, topic discussion, we, we went out for one hour and a half. So you, you see that sometime we are just uh, focused uh, on our discussion. Uh, a, a few words to say that uh, obviously that's a pleasure to, to see this prize 
um, being um, deserved by the community um, to uh, Eva Tardos uh, today. It's quite important uh, prize for us as we, we do have a, a lively uh, scientific community and uh, we do think that um, uh, sharing scientific views with uh, public um, debate uh, is very key, uh, both to science and to the community. So, uh, I think that's really a pleasure to, to see this. I think Jean Kunzmann obviously was one of these uh, key uh, people uh, thinking about cross-disciplinary uh, work and very helpful in, in this area, uh, having as well science uh, not in a, a closed room, but uh, really in an open-minded uh, framework. It's as well what we try to do here. Uh, I will not be able to understand, uh, I think, um, your <laughs> work, uh, maybe uh, two or three words. Uh, I just saw some water wings, uh, and I will take these water wings because at 6.30 I will open a conference on, on water, so it will be cool for me to have these water wings. Uh, I just saw that uh, your work includes some deep work about uh, how uh, selfish behavior uh, can be efficient or not uh, during negotiation and uh, that's a pleasure to see as well some, some work in this area. I remember being myself a guinea pig uh, when I was at the engineering school uh, with some professors uh, playing with us uh, as guinea pig uh, in uh, economic games and, and theory of games and to see how we will behave uh, during those games, so uh, if you'll be back to my uh, engineering time, uh, it will be a pleasure to, to, to see some um, fundamental work uh, on this. And uh, I just would like to, to close this uh, very brief speech saying that we try to connect, so that's a pleasure to welcome you here in the Global Museum because we try to connect science and society. And uh, as well, it's what you do, uh, scientific community, by uh, helping us in some areas like uh, the SP, XP uh, project where we work with uh, young kids uh, with mathematics uh, and as well with the, the team play that we have with uh, the association La Main à la Patte uh, who as well play with um, how science, science can help uh, young people to, to grow uh, and to be connected to, to their future and to our future. So, um, have a great time this evening, uh, congratulations, um, and um, have a, have a key, be sure that you have a, a key role uh, within the global uh, community to help uh, nurture uh, a shared framework and a shared knowledge uh, that is key for us to, to build our common uh, imagination and our common future. Thank you. So thank you, Mr. Mayer. <laughs> um, so I'm Nadia Brauner, as Eric told you. Thank you, Eric, for a nice introduction. And I'm professor at uh, UGA, University of Grenoble. And it's a great pleasure for me to introduce Eva this evening. Uh, so I will present you uh, Eva's work and uh, uh, Eva's uh, life, in a way. So she did her PhD uh, in Budapest, and I have a question. Can you pronounce the name of her, her university? And every Hungarian people I met told me it's very easy. You just follow the letters. So it's Edvash. <laughs> That's it? Edvash. Edvash University. And we know this university in Grenoble because we have some brothers of uh, Eva here with Andras Sebu and Zoltan Sigeti, so scientific brothers who had the same uh, supervisor, Andras Frank, who came also to give a lecture here. And Eva did her PhD on matroids and super submodular functions. And if you want to know more about matroids, you can attend a very nice course in the first semester next week in Master 2 program. Uh, given by Zoltan. Do not hesitate to come, it's really interesting. Um, then Eva went to America and she has now uh, the Jacob Gould uh, Sherman profess Professorship. So Jacob Gould Sherman was a president of the university and, he has, and she is uh, on this chair. 
and she is a professor in computer science. And meanwhile, she was also in very famous places like Bonn, Berkeley, and the MIT. Okay, so what is her uh, research about? Um, I, uh, she started her life, Eva started her life on combinatorial optimization, and she was very famous for that. And then she changed, not completely changed, but part of her work uh, in algorithmic game theory. And you can see, I will not comment this small diagram because I think Eva will do it, but I think it's really interesting and especially for our politics here because it, it might represent public transportation and cars and selfish, um, selfish people, how um, they behave here on flows and uh, in roads. So you will discover all this later. So she has work on efficient algorithm for optimization in traffic routing performance and large scale communication networks. And I wanted to emphasize one work that uh, was really important, other work were important also, but this one is really interesting about outcome of selfish behavior. So the idea here is, is to quantify the efficiency loss when people behave selfish and how to design systems where selfish behavior is really close to optimal, to the optimal for society, and uh, in problems in auctions or in routing. Auctions is en chair in French. Uh, so if, um, she had 18 PhD students, three are still on the, um, on the work, I think. Uh, she, was, she was editor in chief of uh, Siam Journal of Computing, and she's now editor in chief of journal of the ICM, and she's editor of many journals I mentioned here, Kambanatok Rika, for instance. You might be interested in reading books during the holidays that are coming, so I recommend algorithm design and algorithmic game theory, and they are in our library if you need them. Uh, she already got some awards. Um, the first I mentioned is about a strongly polynomial algorithm for circulation in graphs, uh, the Fulkerson, Fulker, Fulkerson Prize. Uh, then uh, I wanted to mention the Danzig Prize. Uh, they mentioned in the prize because of a major impact in the field of mathematical programming. Then the Gödel Prize for laying the foundation of algorithmic game theory. Uh, last year, she gave the Sonia Kovalevsky lecture, and this year she is having the Jean Kusman Prize, but also another that is just announced. Uh, I wanted to finish with uh, her membership. Uh, so she is member of some um, of some. Um, academies. So when it's written national, national means American. <laughs> uh, so American uh, Academy of Science, American National Academy of Engineering, American Academy of Arts and Science. And we, I especially wanted to mention that she's external member of the Hungarian Academy of Science, whose president is Laszlo Lovas, who is a famous, very famous uh, researcher and who is your grandfather, scientific grandfather. And this academy has some problems due to politic problems. And I think it's important to, to mention uh, your membership in this, uh, in this academy. So uh, I'm done now. So it's the important part is coming, yeah? So Eva doesn't need another introduction, so. So thank you so much for both the recognition uh, and also for all of you showing up and being interested. And I hope um, you find this other line of work of Nash, or at least what I can tell you about uh, Nash Equilibria and the connection to uh, my work, <laughs> sorry, 
So maybe given this introduction, you not, don't need a long explanation that one should be interested in selfish behavior, but I still wanted to, or outcomes of selfish behavior, I still wanted to start with, um, you know, selfish sounds like kind of a negative word, but there is a lot of places in our life, and especially in our modern life with the uh, connections through the internet, where um, the selfishness is the natural outcome of how life works. The way uh, your internet writers work is try to write the packages that right in front of them. The way your browser works is trying to download packets from the internet for you is not optimized through a global system. It's optimized through everyone's computer, every writer optimizing for itself. Uh, naturally, selfishly trying to just get through the package that's right in front of it. And what I'm trying to study is when is it that, what's the outcome of this kind of selfish behavior, and when do we have to design systems that are offer or, or forcing more central control, and when is it okay to let things evolve selfishly? So to get you started on what I mean, there is this classical example under the name of tragedy of the commons, where selfishness can really ruin a possibly useful outcome. The story goes that in some uh, little town in England, uh, they had a green patch where everyone who lived in the town was allowed to graze their cows. And you know, with this freedom, apparently everyone who lived in the town did graze their cow there. And the town was growing, and there were more and more cows. And at some point, there wasn't enough grass. Uh, so the cows really couldn't survive anymore. So if I want to turn this into a mathematical model, then what I want to say is that what happened in the grass is that the value of a single cow grazing there is monotone decreasing, is less and less valuable as there are more and more cows. There is not enough grass to eat. And if we only knew how to control the number of cows, there would have been some amount of milk produced, but unfortunately, with no control, everyone just put their cow there, everyone got a little bit of a benefit, but not much. And with too many cows, there practically was no benefit of this grass patch. Um, in contrast, as I might tell you a little bit about, traffic routing is a little bit better, though not perfect. Traffic routing, especially internet packet routing, um, I'm going to also model as a selfish behavior where you can think of cars or internet packets, and either way I want to think of every single packet will just choose a path where it gets to destination as fast as possible without you know, thinking about the rest of the packet. Um, naively, one would think that as I drive home from work, really I'm optimizing for the system, uh, but I'll show you in a second that's not quite true. Um, and I guess, again, I have to start with a slightly, a bit of a mathematical model. So here is a very simple example, and that's what Nadia already showed you uh, in her introduction. So it, here is a bunch of people, I guess one unit, where, by which you should think of a thousand or a couple of thousand people who want to go from some source S to a destination T, and they have two options. One of them is not sensitive to congestion or too many people using it, and they're going to take one hour to travel through. And the other one, the upper link, is the time it takes is proportional to the fraction of people using the rat. So if, you know, half of, uh, X equals half, that is half the people use it, it's going to take only half an hour. So the solution I'm displaying for you, half the traffic goes through in an hour and the other half in half an hour. And as you can realize, this is not sustainable selfishly because you know those people who have to travel on the worst route will say, come on, that's not fair. And so they join the other guys and the, the MV3 solution here is everyone's using this pass that's congestion sensitive All the traffic goes on that one, X went up to one and everyone su suffers one time. That is the bad thing that happened here in the previous solution still up in red. Some people were better off. In the new solution, everyone is worse off. But the new solution is what is this famous Nash equilibrium in which no one can be envious of the neighbor. They all equally well off. And there is nothing much they can do to help themselves. Um, 
to be honest, they could help each other if some of them went back to the previous solution. This example seems well, bad enough, but actually there is a famous brace paradox, which is even worse. So in this little bit bigger network, um, the equilibrium traffic is actually perfectly optimal. So there are four links, two are congestible and have time takes proportional to the amount percentage of the traffic and one, two are not. And either pass, they, if they divide the traffic half-half, then either pass takes an hour and a half to get across, and indeed that's the Nash equilibrium flow. The unfortunate moment will come if some unfortunate city designer puts in the wrong extra road. <laughs> and that would be the road that I indicated on the picture. Um, the funny thing that will happen, that with this extra road in, this previous solution is no longer the Nash equilibrium. People will discover that, hey, I can do better. I can follow that pass, oh, sorry, this pass up here, come down, and then go across. Uh, you know, in the current solution, x is a half on both of those links. Half plus zero plus half, that's only one. I'm saving half an hour, that's amazing. They will do this, oops, traffic again went up to one on both of those links, and the traffic suffers two hours, so it got worse. And this time, literally everyone is worse off. In the previous solution, everyone got home in an hour and a half, in the new solution, they're all taking two hours. And again, like before, there's literally nothing they can do about this. If any one of them changes this rat, they're still going to take two hours. So to turn this into a more mathematical model, uh, I guess we can think of it more abstractly. There is a network, sources and sinks. Of course, not everyone starts in the same place and ends in the same place, but they can all start in different locations. There is some amount of traffic, maybe RI is the amount of traffic rate that goes from some source to sink. And the way I was wanting to model this time it takes, or the cost of traveling an edge, I wanted to put in a cost, and a cost is a monotone increasing function of how many people use the edge, right? This is natural. The more congestion there is a road, the slower it's going to take to get across. I want my cost function to be continuous and monotone increasing, be continuous because it's easier to do maths that way, and monotone increasing because that's what models what happens in the congestion case. So the Nash equilibrium here is um, you know, a, a situation which I called MV free or not envious. A Nash equilibrium is a situation where every single driver is driving on what's currently on the shortest pass. He's feeling that you know, given the traffic everywhere in the city, this is all he can do. Um, Nash proved in a very general setting that there is always is a Nash equilibrium. Um, in the current context, Actually, I'm using maybe a little bit later theorem of Beckman, where the cost functions are continuous, then in increasing there's a Nash equilibrium, which unlike in Nash's solution, people don't even have to randomize. There is a way they can rat. Uh, there's a Nash equilibrium, and also the solution is unique. Um, so maybe I actually have two sli a slide which says what exactly the, the function was, but maybe I already said this, but individual users are choosing a path on which it's as, as, as fast or as less costly to get across as possible. They're summing the costs on the edges. What I was interested in, and I guess that was also part of actually both of the introductions, is quantifying how much the selfishness costs in the welfare of the system. So to do this, I have to evaluate welfare. And maybe the more natural objective function here is, is what's called social welfare. I simply add up the costs of all the users. So you can think of it as the average delay, the average time a person takes getting to a destination, or if you want, the sum of all the times. And this is what I want to uh, evaluate and I want to compare it to a centrally designed optimum. So at least in this work, we're not thinking that 
uh, you can control how many people want to sit, live someplace and work someplace. The only question we're asking is, can I help them get to their destination in a more efficient way? So that's what was dubbed the price of energy, and it's this ratio, take the cost of the equilibrium, preferably a non-randomized, what's called pure standard Ginesh equilibrium, and compare it to a socially designed optimum. A socially designed optimum would be a solution where the mayor can tell people which way to drive. And the cost of the Nash equilibrium is what we're hoping at the time, or what the model assumes, that that will be the outcome of what people will do if we can't tell them which way to drive. Um, and one, one hope that this ratio is not too bad. I guess I will show you one example of a theorem of this kind that uh, we could prove. And with all the works I have with co-authors, I put my co-author's picture as an illustration. This is with Tim Ravgarden, who uh, is currently a, a professor at Columbia University in New York City. Um, we, we proved this comparison that is not exactly what I promised, but almost that. It says that if I compare the Nash equilibrium with a certain cost, with certain traffic rate Ri, compared to a central design optimum, that is when the mayor was allowed to tell people which way to drive, but one that carries double the traffic. Then it turns out the Nash equilibrium is cheaper than the optimum with double the traffic. So a nice way to uh, summarize what it is trying to say is this message that, especially valid on internet, a little bit less valid on car traffic. If you can design your system to be capable of covering, carrying twice as much traffic as what you currently have, then it's perfectly fine to let people selfishly choose their rats. Yeah, and it's not, and not bad. If your system cannot cover twice the traffic, then unfortunately bad things can happen due to selfish behavior. So this was one example of an outcome quantifying or, or uh, saying something quantitative about the outcome of selfish behavior. And since, as you see, this is 2002, uh, since that year, there have been many, many examples and many, many so-called price of energy CRMs in many, many contexts, and that's certain what Nadia mentioned, both in traffic routing and also in auctions, uh, where you let people bid in, again, selfishly. Instead of actually showing you any of these proofs or talking about these proofs, I want to actually turn to the second word in my title and say that um, there is something not quite right in what we were doing over this 15 or so years, uh, and I want to convince you that, you know, we now have a better idea of what one might want to study. So classical Nash equilibrium made the assumption that somehow all the drivers or all the packets in the internet will magically figure out what is the Nash equilibrium of this game. And I want to spend a second trying to tell you that it's an interesting assumption, but not that I really believe in. And in fact, a lot of people don't believe in. And I can offer you something better that hopefully we can more believe in and can make similar theorems about this extension. So the troubles with this Nash equilibrium context is somehow the player had to know, um, you know, especially games where multiple equilibria exist of how to find one, the players need insane amount of information about tra traffic patterns on every day to actually know, um, you know, which one is the Nash equilibrium. And then maybe as a computer scientist, uh, definitely not least, I'm mentioning the, there is a technical difficulty here. Finding Nash equilibrium in many games is computationally hard. So how did people find it if it was computationally hard to do? So I want to propose that especially in internet traffic and actually on internet-based things, auctions also, there is a better model in life. I should model life as a repeated game because people are driving every day of the week over and over again. And as they're driving, some they're, doing, they're choosing options of which way strategies, of which way to drive, and something happens, and they do this over and over again. And what they're hoping to do 
is most day, on average, again, they want to not spend so much time driving, so I'm hoping they, they, they want to have a low average cost to their driving, and I'm hoping they learned. You know, when you start, you might not, you move to Grenoble, you don't know the traffic patterns, but as time goes on, you learn how to behave. So I want to model people as learners. I want to model everyone as they are a learner. Um, I'm going to skip through this. Um, one could hope, and initial work on learning in games, classical work on learning in games did actually hope that, that learning will actually help people find the Nash equilibrium. And that turns out to be actually not true, but it, as I'll show you in a second, it's almost true, even though actually it's not true. So what's a Nash equilibrium? Nash equilibrium, in that sense, would be a solution they come out converge do, where they can repeat that strategy over and over again, and it has the Nash property. Nash property, remember, is they're not envious. Whatever they switch to, would have to switch to other strategies, they don't, they're not better off. This is inequality written on the bottom, and I guess we often call this as a no regret property. They're not regretting not doing something else, because that wouldn't be any better. Um, this actually doesn't happen. And if you want to have some data, this data is coming from Bing, that is Microsoft Advertising Auction. This is data on behavior of certain advertisers of what they do on, on advertising auctions. As it turns out, they don't stabilize. They don't do what this picture suggests, converge to a fixed, fixed outcome. Instead, what they do is change their bits up and down. And this happens all the time. This is a week-long data set, but it happens all the time. It's not super surprising, because I know how they do it. Uh, there are these companies out there. Microsoft has an internal machine learning group that does it for them. Smaller advertisers often hire someone, and these are companies they can hire uh, to optimize the bid for them. And what these companies do is using machine learning. So modeling these people as learners is literally what they do. So, not surprising. Because I'm a mathematical or theoretical researcher, as you have seen in the introduction, I'm hoping to model learning in a mathematical way, and I'm going to tell you in a second what I mean. What I mean is that um, as they learn, as they behave, they can change their strategies as often as they want, but if there is a single really good strategy, which is called SI prime here, they should not regret it. There shouldn't be a single super good strategy that there was there and they're doing much, much worse than that strategy. Okay, this is not ideal. It could be that Mondays you should drive differently than Tuesdays and yet another different way on Wednesdays. But if there is a route that's good every damn day of the week, please notice it sooner or later. This is what the condition is. And I'm slightly cheating because, of course, I allow you a little bit of error. Like, you know, maybe you're not perfect in your learning. There's this epsilon error. I really like this model for a bunch of reasons. So again, repeated what the model is. The reasons I like this model is um, you can do this. There are algorithms that take care of this. And no need to any prior assumption. You do not have to study Grenoble traffic before you move here. In uh, some weeks of trying it, you can just do it yourself. There are many simple algorithms. It's a reasonable behavior assumption in the sense of it just seems so natural. If there is a really good pass, hopefully everyone will wake up to it sooner or later. And last but not least, the last line here is, you know, it's a behavioral assumption that I very much know how to use in theory. It's very, very similar to the Nash equilibrium assumption. And it's almost getting me exactly the same things as the Nash equilibrium if I average over time. There are come a couple lab experiments that I might want to at least tell you about that actually suggest that, yeah, people do do this. Um, there are lab experiments. Both of the two are by other researchers who got some students in the lab and run uh, lab experiments with them. The last one is the Microsoft Ad Data research that I uh, mentioned already, that's actually a paper joined with uh, Denis Nakipalov and Vasily Sirkanis. Um, and um, 
one problem with Microsoft data that I don't actually know what people want it to do. That's often true in a selfish interaction. I don't know what the incentives are. We try to infer the incentives, and here is the results we got. It's not perfect. It seemed like um, you know, about 30% of the people are doing better than my benchmark, which remember is possible. It's possible that on Mondays you drive differently than Tuesdays. 30% of the people figured this out. Uh, there's another about 30% who are doing pretty well, and there are the struggling small little dots there are people who actually are doing quite badly compared to this benchmark. What we are doing as follow-up research is trying to follow those guys, those guys who are doing badly, and watching what they do next week. And indeed, we're finding the next week they're changing their bid. They too realize that something went really wrong this week. So the main theorem that I won't be able to show the proof to you, but I did talk about it in the course that I've been running this week, is that, as I said, the price of energy started with a, a statement of the form that you compare the cost of your solution compared to a centrally designed optimum. That can be lifted to learning if it's the exact same game, then I would take the cost of averaged or summed over time, divided by, um, you know, t times the optimum, it went over t periods. And in more recent work, um, we actually even extended to a situation where it's not even literally the same game. Because after all, things change. Some people move, a new company opens in Grenoble, people move to town, traffic patterns change. Uh, so we can even sustain this, what I call here an extension theorem, that is taking my theorem, for example, the one that said that if you designed your network with twice as much capacity as you need, then selfish behavior is good, and say that selfish behavior is good even in changing environment. That is, learners will be able to adjust to this on their own without them somehow knowing to find the Nash equilibrium. <coughs> so, Maybe as a closing, um, algorithmic game theory is trying to think of combining algorithms and game theoretic thinking. So algorithms here came in because I wanted to think of people not as the magically they knew what an equilibrium is, but as they doing a learning algorithm, which maybe the routers do to some extent, certainly the advertising auctions definitely do it. They have departments that learn for them. They algorithmically find what are the right solutions, um, and it wants to think about uh, what happens in a selfish, people, selfish system when everyone selfishly, through some algorithm, in this case a learning algorithm, uh, wants to um, optimize for themselves. It combines two features, one sort of more from computer science, that is a cent a, a lack of central control where every part or every participant optimizes individually. And second, from game theory, because they don't optimize distributedly to optimize a global system, I don't choose my path to drive to help the traffic in Grenoble, I just want to get where I want to get. That's from game theory. This is, situation is super common in many, many settings, especially on the internet, uh, both auctions or routing. And it's, a, I think, an exciting new area, uh, and uh, maybe throughout the week I convinced some of you to keep work, to, to think about working in this area. And thank you very much. Um, not in traffic routing. So certainly, there, so there are two sort of big class of applications I worked on. Uh, one is traffic routing, and that was taken up by the networking community, so people who do actually route packets on the internet. Um, they have done a bunch of studies taking area networks, in particular, I guess, uh, very big chunk of California, not quite all of it, but a, a big Silicon Valley down to LA area and try to look at how far off the traffic is 
from a central design optimum. So it's a, a, you know, it's a lot of computational work. They collected data from what packets are really like. Then they went home or went wherever with a big computer system and centrally designed, okay, if I want to get this many packets across on the current network, how much better can I make it? And generally the finding is not much better. Uh, so in the internet context, the general belief is something I can't at the moment support theoretically, but that somehow we actually are living off of the traffic and the design of the network co-evolved. And we did literally what my theorem suggested to do. When there was congestion someplace, we increased the pipes. So we have a big enough network and support way more than double the traffic. And as a result, we have a very, currently very good solution. And that's the general belief. In the, whether, you know, it's always true, there's one serious study of this California area network where they actually optimized the traffic with hindsight and found that the actual, what happened is not that much worse. Um, in context of car traffic, um, the, this model has been discussed and certainly there are interesting articles in the civil engineering community where they point out that uh, one time in New York City in the closure of 42nd Street, do I have this straight? 42nd Cross Street, uh, where they were really afraid that that will cause insane congestion because that's a big cross street. Apparently it improved the traffic to close it. There is an LA story about the highway opening and, and increasing the congestion. And there is some discussion of these are life examples of the brace paradox. But of course the philosophy of doubling the road size is less viable on civil engineering. Uh, there is, but these are all just observing the price of energy and discussing it and not uh, constructive as you suggested. There's a lot more constructive examples in the auction design because uh, there's large groups of people coming from the community that I'm also a member of that usually circle around the conference named Economics and Computing uh, that are working for the companies. Google in a large part has a large market algorithms group. Microsoft has a pretty large group. So a bunch of the auction design in internet auction is affected by what we're suggesting, uh, but not in traffic routing. Thank you, Eva. I was curious if this kind of optimization can be used in air traffic control because you have some randomness that's given from the fact that you're trying to optimize many points on the globe, but you also have some directionality because you have somebody who's controlling at least the incoming uh, airplanes into an airport at some radius around it. In, you know, I certainly applies what I said about uh, car traffic or in, even internet traffic that I'm not aware of anyone who wants to use this as a design feature. I would admit that there is one significant weakness of what I'm doing and maybe it's worth pointing out. I like social welfare, that is average delay. Average delay or average whatever, every, adding up everyone's happiness is a reasonable objective function, very reasonable obje objective function on packets if something went wrong in a packet, you just resend it. It's not that big a deal. Uh, it's also good on internet advertising or on advertising traffic, especially internet advertisement, because so what's one advertisement? It's one opportunity to show one ad to one human. Yeah, what a big deal. Went wrong, forget it. So these are things where uh, the value is in the in the volume of traffic and not in an individual interaction. So in my averaging. If there's one airplane that had to stay in the, in the air for two hours, that does barely hurts my objective function, it was one airplane. But that won't work well for airplane traffic. So this summing over everyone's happiness is an objective function that's okay when everyone's happiness came from a lot of little things. So the sum, summing works okay. It works much less well if their individual penalty for one mistake is really big. And that's an actual interesting open area of this whole, all the, I had a slide with a lot, a lot of results 
on positive things we can say for a situation where selfishness is not very hurtful, almost all of them are about social welfare. And if I change my objective to thinking that, yes, but you know, these really bad cases, we should minimize those instead, that's much harder. And it's an interesting open direction of what we can say about that. So at the moment, I don't think we are ready for, uh, for uh, airplane traffic. Thank you, Eva, for this presentation. I was wondering, are there matroids in this theory also, or have you stopped with matroids now? <laughs> uh, matroids. Uh, yes, there are matroids, or something like matroids. So matroids are somehow very connected to or almost synonymous with some modular functions. Um, some modular function is the rank function of a matroid, if you know what a matroid is. If you don't know what a matroid is, some, some modular function is a very natural economy of scale kind of function. Like if I hand you a bunch of goods and then I give you an extra apple, then the model says the value of the apple is diminishes as you already have more food. You know, when it's fr your first item and you're hungry, it's very valuable. When you're ready, I gave you all the oranges and potatoes and all this other stuff, then one extra apple, who cares? Uh, that's what some modular functions are. So economic interaction is often modeled by some modular functions. The assumption is that people do have this sort of valuation. That is, if you hand them a bunch of things, one extra item is becoming less and less valuable as they already have more stuff. So in the auction application, uh, which I'm going to more talk about on tomorrow's uh, the course, the lecture for the course tomorrow. Uh, some of the functions come in all the time, and that's a natural model of 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 how people value additional items. So I I will start by saying that I'm a very naive listener. This is the first time in my life I hear about algorithmic game theory. So I would like to make a connection with. Uh, uh, simple things that we do every day. We have uh, routing technique, routing algorithms, applications that basically take us to point A to point B, and they are uh, able to uh, uh, get uh, uh, information from, from data, from observation. So I just wonder what is the link between your work and uh, m a more data-driven uh, theory of, uh, of traffic, for instance? So I guess what he's pointing out that in car traffic data, um, it's not as much that I'm learning how to drive. It's, you know, if you use Google or Waze or someone to tell you which way to go, then it's Google helping me learn how to drive. Google will tell me how to drive. And what's really happening is Google is running an algorithm to figure out how, the, how to best drive. Um, there are discussions with some Google groups that I know about on trying to, uh, what exactly they should do to improve the traffic better than learning. Google is not quite the mayor, that is, can't exactly tell people which way to drive because if it starts giving you bad directions, you're not going to follow it. You know, you switch to another app that's better at this. Uh, but they actually have an insane amount of central control because a lot of people follow it and as long as it's not too bad, a lot of people will continue following it. So in some way, Google has an opportunity to uh, optimize the traffic beyond the selfish optimization. What they're doing right this very second is literally what I'm talking about. They actually evaluate the traffic. like. One complaint I had against Nash Equilibrium as a possible outcome is that it requires an insane amount of knowledge about the traffic. Well, Google has it. They have that insane amount of knowledge. They just take the current shortest pass and they tell you to go on it. Um, they have an opportunity to do better than this, but what they're doing right now is this, is literally what I'm evaluating. That is, they're trying to put people on what's currently the shortest pass. So, thank you again. Thank you very much. Well, thank that. you. Thank you.